And the title of today's sermon is going to throw you off because it's not about that to the last five minutes. But it's the most glaring thing in these verses that we're going to read in our series of uh, studying the words that Christ spoke. We're going through, uh, for these last few months, we've been going through the red letters in the book of Matthew. Words that are attributed to Christ Himself. Taking time to see what we often hear these days, people saying, well, what would Jesus say? Or what did Jesus say about that? Or I'd rather listen to Jesus than Paul or whatever other things people say. And you realize when you hear some of those things that they probably are coming from people that really don't know what Jesus said about much of anything. And we have discovered on some Sunday mornings that Jesus surprised us and He said some things that were surprising. Somebody posted a cartoon the other day and said, the next time someone says to you, well, what do you think Jesus would say about this? You, you might suggest to them that uh, He might bring out a whip and kick over some tables because they were drawing a reference to the day that Christ did in fact walk into the temple, into the outer court, where people were bartering sacrifices for money, and he just started throwing their tables upside down and scattering their money and their turtle doves, and then he picked up a scourge or wheel, and he just started slinging it at them and driving them out, and that was Jesus. You know, the one that loves everyone. He just loves you no matter how evil you are. He still loves you. He loves you unconditionally. Okay, he might, but he might take a whip to you and throw a table over. We just don't like to see Jesus like that. We, we, like to, we like to create Jesus, not Him create us. We like to create Him. I, I want Him to fit me. I want Jesus to be my kind of Jesus. And so when I'm doing something heinous or evil or wicked or bad or wrong, I just want Jesus to say, oh, I just love you because you're mine. But when you're doing something bad and mean to me, I want Jesus to get you. I want Him to punish you. I want Him to make you have a flat tire and wait. Well, no. We'll go back up from that. I could have been somebody's nemesis. Maybe you were praying for me to be in trouble. And God to fix me. So we just kind of make Jesus what we want Him to be if we're not careful. And it's a, it's a serious theological problem we have. It makes, you, it makes you, what you and I see today, and especially in America, it, it makes us understand the, the possibilities behind several verses in the Bible concerning the end of time. Like, for example, he, he, he taught us that, uh, the Bible teaches us that when the Gentile age is coming to an end, what we refer to as the last days or the end of the age, the Gentile age is coming to an end. He, he taught us that there would come a great falling away, an apostasy. Apostasy means falling away from the truth. So there would be a great deception coming. And, and it, you know, when you see what you see today, it makes you realize the, the lack of certainty, the lack of knowledge of what is true, makes it easier for people to be deceived by that that is not true. Another verse said, Shall he find faith when he comes? As if there's a possibility. There would be so few people of faith as if to need the question to be asked. Will he find it? Another verse teaches that there would be a famine in the last days. But not a famine of bread, a famine of hearing of the word. So sometimes when you see these little silly, cliche-driven things, especially on Facebook and Twitter, we have a lot of Christians in our country who are just driven by cliches and sound bites. If you can throw me a sound bite out that I can live by the day, that's great. And so we do. But we don't really go beyond the sound bite. We don't dig down and see what did Jesus really think? What did he say? What did he mean? What did he believe? So that's the benefit of what we're doing on Sunday morning is that we're just trying to see Jesus as he was presented by those who knew him best. Four Gospels, two of those Gospels were written by men who actually lived with him and knew him, Matthew and John. And that's why we chose those two. We're using Matthew once in a while, we jump over to John and pull the scripture up. Because those two, Mark and Luke didn't travel with him and know him intimately like the other two did. Matthew and John traveled with him and ministered with him and they knew him. They heard him firsthand. So we're taking their course. And so that's what we've got 
That's what we've got today. Today, we're going to talk about blasphemy. But, but hang on. It's only the last part of the sermon. I just threw that title out because it's the most glaring thing in the verses we're about to read. It's the one that will make us stop and say, what? More so than the other. And so we'll get to it in a minute. Here are our verses. From Matthew, the 12th chapter, we're reading starting at verse 22. Then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and he healed him so that the man spoke and saw him. All the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man cast out demons, knowing their thoughts. He said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by fields and bull, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be the good. <clears throat> but if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds a strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age of um, now you saw it, didn't you? When we read through those, the only word that really grabs you and the rest of you is the word blasphemy, and people that won't be forgiven for it. That's why I put it up for the title. It's my teaser to keep you here until I get there. If I know you're ready to go. But you're not leaving until I get to blasphemy. So before we get to blasphemy, we're going to talk about the other things. Here's what the events of the day were. The demon-oppressed man was blind and mute, and he was healed. That's the way the Scripture records it. He was healed. It doesn't per se indicate casting out a demon. It says he was demon-oppressed and he was healed. That's just the way it stands in the Scripture. Number two, the amazed crowd was divided. Some thought that meant he must be the son of David, which is a phrase that would indicate the Messiah. Some thought he must be the Messiah. But others, and in particular Pharisees, the religious crowd, thought that he must be operating under Beelzebub, which is a euphemism for Satan. And then Christ responded to them. And that's the end of our verses for today. That's basically what happened. So what we're going to talk about is how he responded. His response to what they said. And that's where we're going to focus our attention. First of all, he said a kingdom, a house, or a city divided against itself cannot stand. In other words, if I'm working for the devil and I cast out the spirits of the devil, that doesn't work. If you're working for God, then you do the things of God. If you're working for the devil, you do the things of the devil. You don't counter him. And so he, he gave us this phrase, a kingdom divided against itself. We have used that kingdom, I mean that phrase, for a lot of other settings than what he used it in right here. And it's appropriate to use it that Division makes anything crumble from within. Whether you're talking about Satan or Christ, a house divided against itself will not stand. We're going to take a quantum leap away from our topic and just talk about the strength of the statement that he made. Your house, if it's divided against itself, will not stand. A husband and wife constantly opposed to each other will not last. Parents and kids on the opposite side of the fence all the time won't ever have harmony and make a relationship that will last. Employers and employees always divided amongst themselves are not going to last. The friends you have, you have because by and large you can get along with them and agree with them. 
But if you discover after a while you have more opposites than you have likes, your friendship is not going to last very long if you start discussing those things. I have lost friends over the years that I kind of thought would be my lifelong friends. I, I kind of thought we'll never split. And as long as we didn't discuss issues, we had a nice time. If we could just play golf together, life was wonderful. But most of us can't keep our mouths shut about things we're passionate about. And so if over the hamburger after golf, somebody wants to start talking to me about religion, we're probably going to be in trouble. I'm probably not going to be impressed. I'm not going to change my opinion over a hamburger after a golf game. I'm not going to pray with a prayer shawl. I'm not going to start burning candles. I'm not going to feel that I have to present a cross on the front of the property, although I'm very much a cross man. It's just not a religion. It's not a piece of furniture he, he organized and designed. I, I like to just be able to point to a scripture and say, this is why I do this. This is why our church does this. And be able to have a scripture say, this is why we do what we do. I, I don't like following tradition. I don't like following what others say is nice and they've been doing it for a long time not opposed to tradition don't misunderstand it but I remember a verse where Jesus said when you take a tradition of man and then you turn that into a doctrine of God you do wrong you sin it's okay to have traditions but once you make those traditions commandments of God you have violated God if he didn't make it a commandment that's in the scripture. That's something he said. And that's something that I came out of. A denomination, a church that had a lot of great ideas. Nothing wrong with them. Just don't make them a law and a mandate for everybody to follow or they're going to hell and you're not. So that's the rub of most of us. When we start talking religion, it's very difficult to just go back to scripture and not have some other foundation by which we build our case on. Houses divided don't stand. And that's why there has to be unity and conformity in the house, whatever that house is. I've never considered myself a rebel. I've just never always liked the, 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 you know, to follow the crowd without knowing where the crowd was going and why they were going there. But, but even in the seminary, I was called in the president's office two or three times. Proudly now, now I look back with pride as something I used to have to hide with shame. But it was always because I simply didn't agree with the party line. And I would say so to the wrong person, and they would blab it to somebody else, and then I would get a runner come to my dorm room and say, the president wants to see you in his office. And so I would take my lecture, and I would take it bravely like a man, and then I would go away and do what I believed I was supposed to do anyway. <clears throat> and so it was inevitable. It was inevitable that at the semester break, I would either leave or be dismissed because they needed uniformity and likeness. Kingdoms divided against themselves don't stand. And they knew that. So it was either agree or we're going to ask you to leave. We'll give you a chance to leave on your own. So I left on my own. I made a bunch of phone calls, covered my bases, made sure I didn't need a lawyer, any of that kind of stuff, but I left. And you're probably thinking, oh my God, what kind of theological problems did he have? Yeah, I'd be embarrassed to tell you how deep those theological problems were. One of them involved not getting a haircut that satisfied the president. No, I'm serious. My hair was over my ears a little bit, and it was curling front. And uh, they threw my photo back at me and said, that photo will not be in our college yearbook. And I said, okay. I don't mind. And I was supposed to be upset when I didn't care if the photo was going to be included or not. That led to a long, long lecture about a man's hair. I still have trouble today looking for some of you men with long hair. Hippie, go get a haircut. But 
Well, it's got nothing to do with God and religion, does it? I don't, I don't imagine, I don't reckon, I don't suppose Jesus ran down to the Jerusalem barber shop every week and, and got him a white sidewalk cut over his ears. And I tried to explain that once and it didn't work. And all that was happening was we were constantly being divided. Divide, 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 divide. It was good training, it turns out. For marriage. <laughs> you notice how I look this one? So, I don't know why. Instinctively, I turn to the left when I speak, speak of marriage. Oh, that's why, right there. That look. Back over here. Unlike you, I married a woman who has a different opinion of mine. I wasn't thoughtful like you and didn't sit down with my spouse before I married and had discussions about every theological topic we could think of, every intimate topic we could discuss, every financial arrangement we might ever have in 40 years of marriage. Unlike you, we didn't know to talk about those things. You're so wise, all of you married people who are exactly like you. <laughs> So why aren't you collapsing? Why didn't your marriage just fail? Well, some of them did. But there was never going to be any harmony there. But what we have to learn after a while is that a kingdom divided against itself does not mean everybody in the kingdom has to be a clone of each other. It means there has to be unity even where there is difference. Does that not describe many of our marriages? My wife and I have learned how to not talk about certain topics because we finally realize I'm never going to change my bullheaded mind and she's never going to be right. <laughs> so there is no point anymore to bringing it up because the resolution of that matter has nothing to do with the ability to love and respect each other, it's just a difference of opinion on something. Your difference of opinion in your marriage does not mean your house is divided against itself. You're not a fulfillment of this verse because you and your wife, you and your husband have a difference of opinion. That's not what he was trying to describe. I've heard good Christian couples use this verse for a reason why they're not going to make it. But the truth is, this is not about having a different opinion. This is about not being able to agree. And he is using it behind an extreme example of casting a demon out. Why would he do that if he was working for the leader of the demon empire? So what he's really giving us here is not a reason to crumble and fold in the face of adversity, especially in our marriage. So if you've ever been tempted to use this verse to explain why your marriage extinct, don't. You can disagree. The organization that I once belonged to, I think is probably a shell of what it once was and might could have been. And I like to go back historically, analyzing the points where I think they fail, religious organizations. And, and, and I like to go back and say, if they had simply had a policy in which they allowed diversity, this is what we recommend, but you, we're not going to control you. You can believe this, you can believe that, but you can still be part of our body. They would probably be thriving and strong today, but there was absolutely no room for any disagreement, no alternative opinion about things that didn't even matter. And that's what you have to learn in your marriage after a while. Is you got to learn what really matters and what doesn't matter. And then if you still argue over which one of you has to do the dishes more often, does anybody argue over that? Or don't most of you may just do it? <laughs> Are y'all still trying to argue that point? Just, just step up there and do it. I know that's why God made women speak short so they can step up to the sink. But it doesn't make any difference if they don't want to. 
They don't want to. You step up and do it. And get over it. Your house doesn't have to fall because of that little difference there. Just do them. Or learn to drink out of a dirty glass like I do. <laughs> Rinse that tomato juice out of there with hot water and it's as clean as it needs to be. It's not worth fighting your wife over there. A kingdom divided against itself does not mean that you and your wife having a different opinion justifies you ending it. Work it out. Have fun with the relationship. Learn what's critical and what's not critical. Solve issues the best you can. And then do not try to make clones of each other because that will ruin the fun of a marriage. If she ever becomes just like you, you will both be obnoxious toads. <laughs> Notice where I put the pronoun. You didn't hear the pronoun, did you, lady? If she ever becomes just like you, you will both be obnoxious toads. Every lady should have said, right, but don't worry, leave me hanging. <laughs> Number two, Jesus said, whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. And, and this becomes a little more spiritual. I, I'm talking to a, a safe audience here. You know, you're all Christian believers. You're in church today because you believe in Christ. So if I were to ask you, are you with Christ? Of course you are. I'm not sure what it means to be with Christ. And he didn't elaborate. But it's not difficult to get it. You either, another verse he said it this way, you're either for me or you're against me. And again, Christ not interested in making clones. I don't think... I don't think that there's any reason why Pentecostals, Baptists, Catholics, Presbyterians, Methodists, Church of Christ, I, we ought to all be able to sit and worship God together based on our common faith in Jesus Christ. That's not what Christ talked about. Everybody has to agree on this thing. When He says, if you're not with me, you're against me, or if you're for me, you're not against me. If you're with me, you're for me. Whoever does not gather with me is spreading and scattering. What he's referring to is just pretty much what he says. Him. With him. The only arguments that I've had with folks when it comes down to doctrine and theology and, and, and religion, the only arguments that I've had over the years with folks always come back to something I was taught. Yeah, but my church has always believed. Well, my pastor said, well, I was raised to believe. And it's like, okay, okay, okay. I get it. But Jesus in this phrase, He doesn't say whoever is with the church that's coming. He, he makes it very, very personal. Are you with Christ? Can you accept that somebody else is with Christ, even if they're not like you? If they claim to be Christian, but they're not your brand, do you brand them as unsaved? Or can you just accept, okay, I don't go that way, I don't bend that way, I, I, I wouldn't go to that religion, I, I wouldn't subscribe to that idea, but you know, they, they believe they love Jesus. They name Him as their Lord and Savior. Can you just leave them alone and say that's good enough for me? Or do you feel the need to get on Facebook and denigrate them and run them down and smear them and slander them because they're not like you? I'm troubled. Man, I'm, I'm telling you, when, you know, right now the hot topic in America, and that's kind of what we're talking about a little bit on Wednesday night, got a few, uh, got a few interesting Bible studies coming up on the current political things in America. But man, you're talking about dividing lines being drawn. In this country, there is a huge divide line being drawn. And it's, it's out of our control. There's nothing you can do about it. It's, 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 well, to me, it's a fulfillment of a prophetic word. Uh, it's coming. And uh, even Jesus said, as it was in the days of Sodom and Mark, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And where the lines are being drawn. And you talk about affecting Christians and churches. Maybe. But what bothers me is the fire, anger, and hatred that can be spewed by Christians 
against other Christians simply because they didn't take the stand they thought they should have taken or perhaps because they didn't take the stand that they felt they should take. Good Lord, some of the hate stuff I've read lately and the few pieces I've received myself because I dared to venture an opinion in response to someone's request. If you ask me what I believe and I send you my answer to what I believe and then you want to publicize something I sent to you, a piece of it, and then smear me, go ahead. It just it doesn't make you right. It just makes you an idiot. And it still makes me right and humble. <laughs> Man, you know, I don't care really what your opinion of some of the current ministers, uh, Joel Osteen, a good example, I don't care what your opinion of him is. You may, you may like him, you may not like him, but how could anybody justify smearing, criticizing, condemning him just because he didn't say what they thought he ought to say? He, 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 he certainly fulfills this scripture. He promotes Jesus. He brags on Jesus. He says Jesus is Lord. He says Jesus is the only way to be saved. He may crawfish on some hot topics. He may say, well, it's just not for me to judge. It's just not for me to say. He might even humbly say, I just don't understand theology. And you might wonder, why does he try to preach it then? That's between him and God. He's certainly not hurting the name of Jesus. He's certainly not anti-Jesus. Rick Warren wrote the book and uh, you know made a fortune off of it and it put him right in the mainstream of publicity and he got tons of television interviews, so now they turn to him for uh, an answer for political hot topics, and he's never going to satisfy everybody. But man, what surprises me is the language from the Christians who are offended by it. As if we weren't targeted enough by that crowd out there that hates Christ. Did, did you, uh, I don't know if any of you read it or not, but you know Mayor in East Park, uh, Gay Mayor of Houston, you know, tried to get a, an ordinance passed last week that uh, basically had wording in it to allow, had, you know, she said, that after she was elected, she said, we're going to change the world for uh, gays, lesbians, bisexuals, and transgenders. Thank you for all her voters for voting her in. She didn't say that before the election. After the election, she said, we're going to change the world. And then last week, I think for the first time, we really saw what she was going to try to do. She wanted an ordinance passed for the city of Houston, and it worded in there that transgenders, gays, bisexuals, uh, that, they, that a transgender could use the bathroom of his or her choice in the city limits of Houston. Any schools, restaurants, restrooms, anywhere there was a restroom, a transgender could go to the time. And I don't care, maybe you think they, they should. But the thing is, uh, Forget the law, forget God, forget Christianity, forget the Scripture. If I just walk up to a bathroom and my six-year-old granddaughter wants to go into the bathroom and fall, and I'm standing there waiting on her, and some big hairy dude walks up and pushes that door open, I'm going to beat the snot up. I'll go in there with two before and hit him in the back of the head if I have to. Before he'll go in there where my granddaughter is, and you say, oh, well, he's just an innocent. I don't give a hooey. Go down, the, go down the hall to the man's back where you clearly belong. I don't, care what, I don't care what's in your head and what you think you are. I care what I see. And I care where my granddaughter is as opposed to you and your position. Where in the world did common sense go to? How did it vanish in 30 years in America? But it had there is no common sense. The idea that anybody would even disagree with that is ludicrous. I don't care if you're a big hairy man and you think you're a woman, you go down to a big hairy man's restroom and lust. 
You have that prerogative. But don't you go in little girl's bathroom. Not when granddad's standing. Just ignorant. And then all of a sudden, I don't think she thought that Christians had enough unity left to even make a voice. The shock of all shocks. Ed Young, who has much to lose, pastor of Second Baptist, came out against the ordinance. Homophobic pastor. And then uh, who's the other one at the Grace Community Church? Steve Riggle. Steve Riggle came out against it. Homophobic man. And he's redheaded. There's probably a connection there. <laughs> Redheads and homophobes. I know you think I'm being facetious silly. Jump online and read the idiotic comments that people made. Fire. You can't read them in public. I couldn't read them in here. The language is too pitiful and too pathetic. The intolerance is not Christianity. The intolerance is on the other side. Leave it there. Let them be intolerant. Let them hate. But don't you as a Christian turn against a man who is with Christ trying to do what he thinks Christ wants. And because he didn't say it right, you jump on the bandwagon and denigrate him as well. Mercy! Christians dare to run down Ed Young or Steve Rickle or or Joel Osteen because he didn't become vocal enough. And I stumbled onto a site where he was called, the first 40 or 50 I scanned down were just vile, putrid remarks against him from the anti-tolerant group. And then, and then I started finding some that were, listen, I'm a Christian, but I just want to go on record and say, I too think that he should have stood up. But he should have stood up for for the ordinance. And uh, man, you can't win in America. Take a stand, you're going to be in trouble. Don't take a stand, you're going to be in trouble. And, and can we just leave that with that crowd out there instead of this crowd in here? If somebody is for Christ, leave it be. They may not be like you, they may not agree with everything you do. They may say it differently than you do, but this is what the red letters in the book say. Jesus said, whoever is not with me, they're against me. Whoever does not gather with me, they're scattered. At least there are men who are gathering with him, and they may not be your denomination, they may not be your pastor, they may not be your friend, they may not be your kind, but if they're trying to gather to Christ, they're doing his work. They're not against you. Leave them alone. Shame on Christians who tear other Christians down when they're doing what they're doing in the name of the Lord and for His kingdom. Third thing is where our uh, title came from today, and that was blasphemy. And here is the interesting rub of these verses. He said that blasphemy of every kind will be forgiven. He even said even those who blaspheme against the Son of God. Blasphemy against Christ, but not blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Man, that's intriguing. Will not be forgiven. And he didn't just say will not be forgiven. He said neither in this or in the one to come. Pretty much meaning eternity. You're done. Jesus said not some little hard-headed, duct-taped, Bible-thumping preacher who said, You're never going to be forgiven! Jesus said, He that blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. And, and I, I want to be forgiven and I don't want to be a blasphemer. So I just wanted to offer you a little definition and then I think you'll see exactly what Christ was talking about. Blasphemy means to injure the name of or injure the reputation of or to disqualify maliciously. Uh, to blaspheme the Spirit of God is to speak against Him in such a way as to destroy His reputation or name, to discredit Him to someone so successfully that they would not turn to God for answers or hope. If 
you can so successfully downplay God, church, Christians, religion, if you can make such a good case against God being worth a dime to anyone that in their time of need, the last thing they would turn to would be God, you have blasphemed God. You have injured His name and reputation so successfully <clears throat> that you have prevented someone from turning to Him. And Jesus said, those who do this will not be forgiven. It's intriguing. Look at Matthew 23, verse 1. Jesus said to the crowds and to His disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so practice and observe whatever they tell you, <clears throat> but not what they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen of others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. That's a reference to the garment, the prayer garment, the tied knots at the end. That, that were kind of like a visible display of look how spiritual I am and how often I pray. And they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, rabbi which means teacher. Uh, for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. And call no man father on earth, your father on earth, for you have one father. He didn't mean your dad, but some in, in his movement and uh, uh, the Jewish movement were already referring to uh, the priest as fathers. And Jesus just said, don't call anybody your father on earth. You have one father who's in heaven. Neither be called instructors. You have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And I read all that to you to get to these verses. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites. You shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves, nor allow those who would enter to go in. Verse 14 is omitted. This is the ESV I'm reading. King James Version actually has a verse in there about widows, devour widows. And the reason it's omitted in ESV and NIV is because it was not in the earliest manuscripts we have. It was in supplied manuscripts later. And so I didn't include it here because I like to read the ESV. And it doesn't change it or anything. It just throws in one statement about it and you devour widows. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. That means a convert. You'll go far and wide to convert somebody to your ideal. But when you do, he becomes twice as much a child of hell as you are. When he becomes a prophet, when you convert him to your theology, you have not saved him. You've made him twice the child of hell that you are. Does not sound like Jesus thought very much about the scribes and the Pharisees. It doesn't sound to me like he agreed with them, does it? It doesn't sound like he encouraged anything they did in the name of God. What they were doing was turning people away from the true fulfillment of scriptures. They were missing it even as he, the fulfillment, stood in front of them. And he cursed them with a curse. Not only are you going to hell, but those you convert are going there with you. When you make a proselyte, when you make a convert. So that, those verses being read, read letters also, what Christ said, go back to the definition. To blaspheme the Spirit of God is to speak against Him in such a way as to destroy his reputation or name, to discredit him to someone so successfully that they would not turn to God for answers or hope. The scribes and Pharisees were getting people to turn to the Jewish law, but they were making sure they didn't accept Christ, the fulfillment of that very law. God in the flesh. God himself come to man. To blaspheme the Spirit of God, according to those verses, would be therefore to make someone twofold the child of hell that you are, or that the proselyte is. I say all that just to wrap up with this comment. In America today, there's a dynamic at work to nullify the Word of God. Have you noticed it? Have you sensed it? Have you seen it happening in your schools where Six-year-olds are told by a walking-by teacher to put their Bibles up. They can't read a Bible. 
in an American public school at recess break time. They can't read their Bible. Thankfully, there's still a handful of lawyers around willing to just sue the snot out of a few school districts and teachers who don't get it yet that the Constitution protected our right to freedom of religion, to worship whom we see fit to worship. To read that Bible whenever you want to read it, whether you're on recess at school or parked out in the parking lot at school. Not a right to disrupt, tear down, overtake something else going on. Just the right to your private reading, right to your private worship, freedom of your speech to express that that's what you do. That's who you believe in. There's something scary going on in America. Our rights are being taken without even violating the law. And we're all sitting and saying it's okay. It's just the way it is. You saw the NFL, uh, an opening a homosexual player was drafted. He turned to his gay lover and embraced him, and then they kissed each other on the mouth. And another NFL player just posted a tweet. If that's the right word. He tweeted horrible. That's disgusting, or something like that. He didn't say anything vulgar. He said horrible. I don't know why he doesn't have the right to express an opinion. And I don't know how the NFL legally can find him for making that comment. And worse, now, and for any of you who may have questioned when I told you, it's coming to your kindergarten. Reprogramming and brain training is coming to your kindergarten and is coming quickly. Then you should at least go back and ask yourself, how can the NFL require that fine the player now whom they've imposed a fine on because he's at Harvard? Now he can't play in the NFL until he attends classes, retraining to keep him from being a homophobe to make him embrace the lifestyle and accept it. If he wants his career to continue, he has to pay the fine and be reprogrammed to accept homosexuality. And they can do that in America? Legally? He, he, he bases his disgusting on a Christian principle that it's a really, really atrocious sin. I know there are many other sins named, but that particular sin in the book of Romans is linked to reprobation of mind. It even says, and God will turn them over to believe a lie and be damned by it. It is called an abomination in the Old Testament. And it was for that sin that two twin cities were destroyed by God. And some people will post and tweet what did Jesus ever say about homosexuals? Nothing. I'll tell you what Jesus said about homosexuals. He said, as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the man. He acknowledged that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and he did not apologize for God. Amen. Wasn't the modern Jesus supposed to say, hey, now about that little Sodom and Gomorrah thing that my father messed up on. I'm sorry he got it wrong. He didn't. He just said, it's going to be that way at the end of the day just before the judgment comes. Just before the end comes. He said even worse things. He described that judgment coming as sending people to a place where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Oh, we don't want to read those things from our Jesus who just loves. You know, are you hearing me today? Lord, how far, how far we have fallen from just understanding why we're here. Some of us think we're just here to have fun, have a great time. My goodness, why do they expect me to do that? I gotta have fun this weekend. I gotta have fun. I gotta have fun. I gotta have fun. I gotta have fun. We just live. We forget we're here for a purpose. What are we here for? Can you imagine? Can you just pretend for a moment you're God? Just imagine being God. You, you create this creature. We'll call him uh, an animatronic you made, and he can do almost everything you can, except he can't create like you create. And, and, and you'll, even, you'll even fix that. You'll let him procreate so he can make others just like him. But he can't make you because you made him. 
And when you made him, you knew his batteries, his batteries will, will need recharging every seven days. It's the way I designed it. So I'm going to tell you, you work hard six days, but every seven days you pause because you need it. Your batteries need recharging. Long and happy life, you, you need that seventh day to just stop. Put the brakes on. Relax. But, but if I just tell you that, you're like me. You're wired 220. You'll just keep going. And so if I don't give you some religious connotation, you probably won't stop. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to call that my day. So you pause on that seventh day that you need to rest and just remember me. Honor me, your Creator. And rest at the same time. That way you get rest and you honor me. And I look forward to the visit and the fellowship because six days you're going to be running crazy. And on the seventh day, you and I get to visit a little bit and you get to rest. Wouldn't it be cool to make something like that? And then after a while, to get up on that seventh day and kind of be waiting for your animatronic to come back. And the animatronic is at the mall and at the lake building stuff in the backyard, working on the car. You're like saying, hey, 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 you need to slow down, don't see me. And, and that's where we are. God made us. We need, we need to rest. Our bodies need it. You need a day to just slow down. And, and, and all he asked, he didn't ask for the whole day. He just asked for like an hour or two in the morning. Just come see me. I know you're busy during the week working like I made you work. Just slow down. See me. And I know I'm oversimplifying the whole stretch and the whole reach, but that's our God. He's not some mean, evil thing. He's also not some ignorant, foolish thing. He set all this in motion with a carefully, cleverly designed Gave us a book to read, spanned over 1,500 years of writing from men who could not have known each other over 1,500 years, obviously. And yet, not knowing each other, every book contingent on the other just keeps fitting and fitting. None of them disqualified because they mistakenly wrote according to the science and knowledge of their day. You know how easy it ought to be to discredit the Bible? Because somebody should have said in there, they didn't know the world was round until you know, a few hundred years ago, somebody should have said, and and the, the flat earth or something. And they didn't. They left all their scientific knowledge out so that the book is not discreditable. And it took over 1,500 years to write it. And then somehow, miraculously, it just all came together and people found the pieces here. I saved that and put that one with it. And all he's trying to do is just like, don't forget me. And, and now all of a sudden, not in my lifetime, in the last 30 years of my life, there has been such a concerted effort to mock, to denigrate, to destroy, to vilify anything and everything from the Scripture. There's even a gay Bible now. They have rewritten the Bible. It's actually selling very well. They have taken out Paul's language in Romans. They have made sure when John lays on the breast of Jesus, that's a homosexual embrace they share. And it's selling very well. I'm sure the publishers are proud. I don't know about you, but you need once in a while to slow down at least one day a week and try to find your God again. Try to reconnect with Him. You don't have to go digging through the Scriptures to become a theologian, but it would really be helpful if we just reconnected and made sure that at least one day a week we find Him. We get back in touch with the one who made us find out our purpose for being here is not just to kick up our heels and have a great time. We're going somewhere when this one's over. I want to go the right direction. Don't want to be a twofold child of hell because I'm deceived by a proselyter. And there's a dynamic at work destroying, denigrating the very God who inspired us, inspired the Bible, people who are living by it. So I close with this today and tell you, don't be dismayed. 
don't be dismayed by all of that. They have their reward, you have yours. And I use that last phrase right from the scripture, Luke 6, 22. Jesus said, Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil. And they do all those things not because you have a bad personality. You understand this verse? They do it because of the sake of the Son of Man. You see it? Verse 22. Verse 22 is really saying, when you live for me, you live for Christ. That's the Son of Man. Somebody's going to hate you, ostracize you, insult you, scorn your name as evil. And they're doing it for the sake of the Son of Man. It's not about your bad personality, although some of you have it. It's because you're taking a stand for Christ. You'll be hated. You'll be mocked. I've lost a couple of friends already over some political issues. I don't think they'll be coming back my direction. I'm not going theirs. But that's okay. Because Christ knew it was going to happen. He warned us ahead of time that it would happen. And then He said in verse 23, I don't think I can do this. I can, I can do the be glad part but the leaping for joy, I tried to jump across a little creek the other day on a golf course to get over to my ball. It has surprisingly been a long time since I actually tried to jump. I didn't realize it had been that long. I think I can remember jumping from here to the front row. I'm pretty sure when I was 20, I could just flat-footed jump 15, 25 feet. <laughs> I know I could jump more than two feet, which is about how wide the creek was. And I didn't make it. And I read this verse this week, and I thought to myself, Lord, I hope you don't expect me to leap too high. I'm going to be glad. Let America do what America's going to do. Let the press vilify and hate. Let people jump on the internet and crucify us Christians and mock us and smear us. Whatever they choose to do, it's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. But all Jesus did when He knew that day was coming was look you right in the eye and say, when that day comes, be glad. Leap. Leap for joy. Because you have a great reward coming just for taking a stand with the Son of Man. And that's it. You have a reward coming. That's enough to be happy about. Stand, please. Somebody say, I was glad. I was glad. When they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Give the Lord a hand of praise, Father. Thank you for the promise of the Lord. Thank you for the promise of eternity. Thank you for the promise of the reward. Thank you that you assured us that you were not surprised when the world turned against you and you're not surprised when it turns against your followers today. You warned us a long time ago that the day would come, we wouldn't be popular, we wouldn't be loved, we wouldn't be embraced, we'd even be turned against and ostracized. But you never told us those things to leave us hanging on the edge of fear. You always told us, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And in this instance, you told us to be glad and leap for joy because you have a great reward in heaven. Thank you for the promise of our reward in Jesus' name. And everybody say, man.